Hey guys, so I wanted to talk a little bit more depth today about the medical science liaison role and the MSL role, and in particular about breaking into the role, being able to determine which kind of company is best for you, the therapeutic areas that are probably the most attractive today in the industry, and then also talk a little bit about some of the changes that I foresee for the medical science liaison role in the next few years. First, let's talk a little bit about the MSO role in terms of salary. Today, the MSO role is a very competitive role, and I've mentioned before, on average, for every position, you get about 200 applications, and of course, you only pick one person for the position. So it's a very um, selective role. To give you an idea, if you were gonna apply to a seven-year medical program, on average, they might get about three to 400 applicants and select 20 people. So it gives you an idea um, of how selective an MSL role is, pretty selective. Now, what can you expect in the MSL interview? Usually the interview is gonna be a phone interview to screen, then they're gonna have you come in, they're gonna have you meet with different members of the medical affairs team, of course, the medical science liaison manager, director, and then they're gonna also ask you to present. They're gonna ask you to give a presentation, either a clinical or scientific presentation, or, or, or any topic that you choose, doesn't have to be clinical or scientific, just to see how you present information. So they're really looking at your ability to articulate and communicate information in a very effective way. If that goes well and you're offered the position, typically what happens is the compensation will consist of a base salary and a bonus, and if it's a publicly traded company, stock options. Now, for the base salary, what we're seeing today, and, and this is in the year, of course, 2022, almost going to be 2023 in a few weeks, is that on average, medical science liaisons are beginning at around 125, 130 in terms of base salary, but that can go all the way up to over 200,000 at a beta for a base salary. Just depends on your experience and your degree. MDs typically they get more money than um, a pharmacist or a PhD. So they're typically going to be compensated um, at a higher pay rate. Um, bonus is usually about 15 to 25% of the base salary, and then you get stock options. Um, sometimes you'll get a company car if the company um, has that policy, or they'll give you a company car stipend, which can range anywhere from six to $800 a month. So from a fin financial perspective, they're pretty lucrative roles. And as you can imagine, this is why many people, especially pharmacists, want to work as medical science liaisons. Um, now, which kind of company do you want to pick? And you know, how does therapeutic area play into this? Does it matter you know, what your PhD is in or you know, what was your therapeutic area as a physician, for example? Yes and no. If you're a PhD, what you studied you know, in your postdoc uh, or what you focused on to get your PhD, that's not gonna matter as much. It, it, does it help if you were you know, doing something in oncology um, or immune-based therapies and you're gonna go for a position in that space? Yes, th that might be seen as more favorable. But if you were to get an MSL role, let's say in cardiovascular disease and you have an immune or onco background, that's probably not gonna matter much. For a physician, same thing. If you specialize in a certain area or an oncologist, and now you want to be an oncology MSL, which probably is not, is not likely to happen. It's probably a downgrade because you would, you know, get a lot less pay. But in that situation, you know, again, you'd be favored more likely than other candidates. Now, for pharmacists, they're a little different. They don't have a particular therapeutic area of focus generally, right? Because a lot of them are coming out of retail or the hospital setting, or some of them are coming right out of, you know, a fellowship program, for example. And they just recently graduated. In those situations you know, the companies are kind of therapeutic area agnostic. So from that standpoint, what I would say is that, you know, the therapeutic area doesn't matter as much. That being said, though, that being said, the probably the most lucrative therapeutic area today is oncology. So oncology is the area where you have the highest number of drugs that are being queued in the pipeline by the FDA, you know, for approval. So that's where you're gonna have the most jobs naturally speaking, okay? Now, how do you choose between, you know, a big pharma, a mid-sized company, a biotech? How does that work? Biotech companies generally are probably going to be easier to get into than maybe a big pharma. And really, the simple reason is that 
most people know of big pharma companies. So they're going to naturally get more applicants, whereas a small biotech company probably isn't going to have as many applicants that are aware of the company. So their competitive pool is a little bit less. So if you like that and you know and you're struggling and you you know you're okay with working for a small biotech, that's a solution. Um, the negative of working for a biotech is that you're not going to see a lot of established processes. So you might you know kind of be a jack of all trades there. Um, so if you like that, that's your thing. That could be exciting. And the other negative is that with a biotech, if it's a you know a situation where they only have one product or they're about to get an approval, um, it's a risk. Right, because if they don't get the approval, they might have to disband the medical team. That happens. Um, if they get the approval, they only have one product. Um, if, then they could be likely to get acquired by a large pharma. If they get acquired, you could get laid off. You can lose your job. That could happen. Conversely, if they get acquired, the stock might shoot up very high, and now all of a sudden your stock options are worth a lot of money. That can happen as well. So there's some risk, but the reward can be certainly great. Now, where do I see the medical? Uh, science liaison role going in the future. What I'm seeing is a greater reliance on virtual MSLs as well as greater reliance on digital and AI technology. So I think the medical science liaison professionals of the future are going to be folks that have a broad set of skills that they're trained in, like digital technology, AI, things like that, um, and also understand things like healthcare administration, bioinformatics and whatnot, pharmacogenomics. And they're really going to act truly as liaisons within the healthcare community to kind of build that bridge for their company, but in a different way, not just in only being kind of therapeutic area experts. So I think that's going to evolve considerably. And I think more and more medical science liaisons will become the face to healthcare providers when it comes to providing that information at a first line level versus pharmaceutical sales reps, which still today, you know, provide that role. I think it's going to change significantly with the increase in biologics and biosimilars in the space and more specialty products. So if you like this content, you found this useful, be sure to like, subscribe and comment below. Thank you.